You may be seated. The promises of God, we have it in his word. Amen. What a wonderful joy to know that God himself has spoken and he has not stuttered. We have the promises of God and they are yea and amen. And we can count on them. We've talked about that this morning on the promises that God gave to Israel. And God has given us in the church great and precious promises as well. What a wonderful joy it is to know that those promises are true. Please take your Bibles and turn with me to Acts chapter 16. Tonight we're looking at verses 6 through 8, the message entitled, Do Not Enter, Divine Direction, Part 1. You've often seen those signs. You're driving down a street and suddenly there's a sign in front of you that says, Do Not Enter. It's a one-way street. And God has some one-way streets. God has some Do Not Enters in our lives. And some of them are clear and some of them don't seem to be quite so clear, but Paul got some very clear direction concerning where he should go, what he should do, when he should do it, and how he should do it. And tonight we want to look at how do you determine in your life when God wants you to enter and when God does not want you to enter, how do you know his will? How do you find out his will? What are the keys to it? What are the steps necessary to take so that you know that you're in the center of his will, which I hope is the goal of each and every one of us here tonight. Acts chapter 16 and verses 6 through 8 we'll be looking at. I'll read first verses 4 and 5 because that's the introduction to what we are looking at tonight. Acts chapter 16 beginning in verse 4. And as they went through the cities they delivered them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. Verse 6, Now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, after they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. And they, passing by Mysia, came down to Troas. Let's join in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that you might grant to each one of us wisdom to know your will, and then courage to do your will. You've promised that if any lad can ask in faith, that you will give to that man liberally and not, not upbraid him. So as we ask for wisdom, Father, we ask in faith, because we believe your word is true. And Father, we do want to be in the center of your will, each and every one of us here. It's the only safe place to be. It's the only wonderful, pleasant place to be, in spite of external circumstances. It's the only place where we know we'll gain the most heavenly rewards. So, Father, we pray for your guidance and direction in this message tonight, that Jesus Christ would be glorified and exalted, and that your people might be blessed. We commit these things to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you recall that last week, as we looked at verses 4 and 5, we learned that there were 22 things listed for us in those two verses about what it means to establish the church, what's necessary for building up a church, what's necessary for making it strong in the faith, making it a church that will continue and keep on going in the future. And we'll run through those very, very quickly, just give you the few words uh, on each one of those 22 things, because that's the foundation for what Paul is about to do and the direction that God gives him. He's already seen the process at work. In fact, he has participated in it. He's led in the process, and then suddenly, God does something totally different with him in verses 6 through 8. We notice, first of all, that the process was active and not passive. They went into, uh, through the cities. Second, the process was systematic and methodical. They went through the cities. Third, the process was comprehensive. They went through the cities. <laughs> That's a big job. Number four, the process was continuous as they went through the cities. The process was a function of teamwork. They went through the cities. We emphasized different words as we went through that text and we're able to see their incredible things just in the individual words as you look at them in the context. Number six, the process was accomplished by seasoned and gifted men. It was they. Paul and Barnabas, who went through the cities. The process was accomplished by a careful preparation and communication. They delivered them the decrees for to keep. It was not a matter of making it up as they went along. It was not a matter of conte uh, cultural contextualization, as has happened in modern missions. We talked about that to some extent last week. The process was targeted. They delivered them the decrees for to keep. 
And if you've got a message, you've got to have a target for it. The process was content-oriented, not the, you know, sort of feel-good, fuzzy, mush kind of stuff. It says they delivered them the decrees. That's content. The content was extensive, decrees, plural. The process was mandatory, not suggestive. They delivered them the, for the decrees for to keep. For to keep, it's mandatory. The process was divinely ordained through human instruments. The decrees for to keep that were ordained. The process was authoritative from qualified authority. They that were ordained of the apostles and elders. The process recognized multiple levels of authority, the apostles and the elders, and we talked about the balance between that last week. The process, number 15, was standardized. The apostles and the elders were in agreement. There was not one set of rules sent out by the apostles, a different set sent out by the elders. All the elders who were present and participated were in agreement. The process was centralized, which were at Jerusalem. The process was methodical, and so were the churches established in the faith. By this means, uh, it was not only methodical, but also methodological. The process produced consistent results, and so the churches, plural, all of the churches, there was the same result in all of the churches, and so were the churches established. Number 19, the process produced stability, and so were the churches established. The process resulted in a defined body of truth, and so were the churches established in the faith. And we talk about how every place in the New Testament where that phrase, the faith, where those two words are combined together with a definite article attached to faith, when it's the faith, whenever you find that, it is an articulated body of truth. It's not just sort of general things about faith, it's an articulated body of truth. It's the principal core truth, which is called the gospel, who Jesus is, what he did, what's necessary for salvation. Number 21, the process resulted in solid church growth and increased in number daily. And we talked about the two different aspects of church growth, numerical growth, which they see taking place here, and what they're also doing as they go back to the churches on this journey, places where they've already planted the seed of the gospel, they're looking for spiritual growth. So there's numerical growth in church growth. There is spiritual growth in church growth. God must bring about both types of church growth without the clear work of the Holy Spirit. Neither type of church growth will occur. All of us want to see numerical growth. What God wants to see is spiritual growth among those who have been saved. Number 22, the process resulted in rapid church growth and increased in number daily. That is rapid church growth. So, what did we call it last week? I told you that I had just taught you how to do something that's called inductive Bible study. It's a very good passage for using that when we studied inductive Bible study, how to go through a passage and ask questions. On every word you ask questions about it. What's it trying to tell me? And how does it connect to other portions of scripture? And, and what is there here? And is there anything after we did the English, we would go into the Greek and we'd talk about does this word have implications? Where else is this Greek word found in the New Testament and so on? That's what's called inductive Bible study. And so I gave you a sample of what inductive Bible study is last week as we went through uh, this particular passage there. It's very, very important to understand that because that will help you as you read the scripture. If you want to know what a passage says, you stop and look at the words. You talk about its context. You talk about its interrelatedness with other passages of scripture. Uh, is this referring to anything that was in the Old Testament? Is uh, an emphasis being made here and possibly even a quotation or an allusion that will give me insight into a passage in the Old Testament, perhaps a messianic passage, perhaps a prophetic passage? Many questions produce many good answers as you tie them together. And that's the way to do inductive Bible study. <clears throat> we noticed something about the elders. We could have gone even further with just looking at the elders. It talks about the apostles and elders. If we talked about apostles, we could have gone in and studied the spiritual gifts. Talking about elders, it would have taken us to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1. It would have taken us to passages over in 1 Peter and other places where elders are mentioned. We see that they had proper qualifications. We see that they were involved in prayer. We see that they were involved in fasting. And we talked about when was the last time you fasted. We saw that there's a commendation of them to the Lord. 
We saw that they are men of faith on whom they had believed. Very important as you study the scripture to compare scripture with scripture. Don't take a text out of context on a pretext. Because then you'll end up with no text at all. You'll end up with only your own ideas. So as Paul is traveling with Silas through these various churches, they've already ordained elders in there, and they're going back to check out on those elders. And we saw how Paul addressed the Ephesian elders in Ephesians chapter 20, for example, showing the dangers that can happen to a body of elders. Once a man has reached that position, does not mean that he's home free. What it means is he's going to come under greater attack. There's going to be a greater attack from the flesh. There's going to be a greater attack from the world. There's going to be a greater attack from the devil to manipulate and control because, you see, Satan always heads for the head. If he can control those who are in charge, then he can control everybody under them. That's why Satan is so interested in the seats of power in government because he knows that if he can control the leaders of a land, he has control of the people of the land. And he does that same thing in churches as well. We saw that the apostles were elders. 1 Peter 5, 1, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. So establishing a church in the faith covers a lot more than we just saw in those 22 things that are mentioned for us in the passage. But at least it gives you a start. It gives you a place where you can move from those words that you find in the text to other portions of scripture which talk about the same thing and expand on what you have learned. Very important, and I encourage you, of course, to continue in your inductive Bible studies. That brings us down to verses 6 and following. Now, when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia, but were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, after they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not, and they, passing by Mysia, came down to Troas. So tonight we're beginning an overview of divine direction. How to know the will of God when there is not specific scripture on the issue at hand? When I was in college, the young people were always asking the question, you know, what does the Bible say? Who am I supposed to marry? And they couldn't find Jane or Sally or Bill's name any place in the text. You know, so how do you know God's will? How do you know God's will? Are there any principles in scripture so that we can know the will of God and not be guessing at it, shooting in the dark? hoping that we'll hit something out there that sort of is in line with what he really wants us to do. How do you know what is the will of God? Now, the question here in the text is actually a missionary question. There's the question that's being asked that basically says, shall I go west or east or south or north? And where shall I stop to preach? It's very important to note, I think, that the question is not, shall I preach the gospel? The issue was, where shall I preach the gospel? God never changed Paul's commission. He merely changed his direction, and he changed the target people group to whom Paul was going to go and preach. God doesn't always keep us in one place, at one target group, as you see with Paul on his missionary journeys, God moved him in very interesting ways on his first, second, and third missionary journeys before Paul finally got sent to Rome uh, at the expense of the taxpayer all the way to uh, Caesar himself. And he dwelt in Rome and for two whole years, we find it in the last verse of the book of Acts, in his own hired house and he was allowed to have anybody come and go with him. There he was in the capital city of the entire Roman Empire having an opportunity to witness and share the gospel. Different target groups, different times, different locations, different prayer partners, different uh, missionary partners, but as Paul goes through his missionary journey, God gives him the same commission, but he gives him different direction as to the target group where he is supposed to travel. And God does that with our lives as well. If you will note, throughout your life, you've had different target groups. Maybe when you were in elementary school, you had one target group with your friends. Uh, when you got into college, you had a different target group. When you got into the workforce, you had a different target group. But you didn't have a change in the commission that God gave to you. Preach the gospel, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, repute, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, and folks were living in that time. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now you can't individually do that. There are seven billion people on the face of planet Earth. 
But you can do your part of that. And every one of us should be doing our part in that. How you do it? God may give you different ways that you're doing it. The target groups? God may give you different target groups. He almost always does. But the commission remains the same. Now, if you look at a map, and some of you probably have maps in the back of your Bibles, and if you want to turn to that map that shows the second missionary journey of the Apostle Paul, because uh, some Bibles actually give maps for all three missionary journeys, and then they give you a, a picture of where Paul went as he traveled on his way to Rome. As you look at that map, you will learn something. Look at a map showing the first century A.D. with the cities that are listed in our text. We read a whole bunch of cities there in our text. Uh, we talked about the region of Phrygia and Galatia. We find uh, there's Mysia. We find there's Bithynia. We find there's Troas. Uh, a number of cities are mentioned here. And if you look at the map, those cities are normally put on those missionary maps. Paul's missionary maps, that is. Now, if you look at that, you'll see that is quite a long distance that Paul travels as he goes from Iconium all the way over to Mysia and is bypassing many, many cities along the way. In fact, that distance, depending on which route you take, is between 250 and 300 miles. And Paul was walking. <laughs> How would you like to walk 300 miles over the kind of territory that you saw in the video that we showed on Wednesday evening? Because that was in the region of Iconium and Lystra and Derby. And Paul walked all the way across central Turkey before he got to the coast of the Aegean Sea, which is where Mysia is located. That is a long distance. And God told him not to stop at any of those places. He's passing through Galatia, and then he passes through Asia Minor, and then he finally reaches Mysia. 300 miles of walking. God didn't change his commission to preach, but God changed the target group, and God said, that is not my target group, that big, huge area that you're going through right now. For you, Paul, that's not the target group. I've got a different target group for you because I'm going to take you across the Bosphorus. I'm going to take you over into Macedonia. I'm going to take you down into Greece. We'll say a few things about that in just a few moments, the Lord willing. So he walked all the way across Asia Minor from Iconium, which was the last stop on his return loop, visiting the cities where he preached, to get to Troas on the eastern shore of the Aegean Sea. God the Holy Spirit made it clear to him that he was not supposed to go north. The Spirit forbade him. Or to go south, or to go east. God told him to go west. Go west, young man, go west. In practical terms, this has made all the difference in which half of the globe God sovereignly chose to be the repository of the gospel. You think about that. The direction Paul went meant that that's the direction that the most powerful thrust of the gospel in the first century occurred. And because of that, the thrust westward, and because of the Roman Empire and the roads that they built, even over into England, carried the gospel to our ancestors. And our ancestors then came across the Atlantic Ocean and planted the gospel here in America. What difference would it have made if Paul had gone east and, say, reached China and Japan and Tibet, Mongolia. What if God had sent him that direction instead? Do you think there would be any change, any difference in the history of the world today? Perhaps from China or Japan, a ship would have sailed across the Pacific to carry the gospel to America. But what a different population there would be in America today. Or perhaps it would have gone up through the north, through Russia, and across the Bering Straits, 
and the Aleutian Islands and into Alaska and down through Canada. Perhaps it would have come that way. Do you understand how the sovereign choices of God in history affect the way in which the gospel has been spread and the groups of people, the target groups to which it's been spread? Perhaps it would be China sending missionaries to America and Europe today and perhaps America and Europe would have some form of what we know as communism. And we would be the oppressor nation. God made the choice because Paul tried to go a different direction and the Holy Spirit would not let him go a different direction. There are things that transpire in our lives that make all the difference in the world. Each one of you has at some point come to a crisis point in your life. You've had to make a choice and go one way or the other. And you at some point have felt compelled to go a certain direction. We'll talk about those compelling motives a, a little bit later. But you have felt compelled to do a certain thing or you have felt compelled not to do a certain thing. What a difference it makes. Now, you know, church history records Thomas going east as far as India, where he was martyred. Church history records James going north into Armenia. The book of Acts records the Ethiopian eunuch going south into the Af African continent. But God sent Paul west so that the gospel would get to Greece. Very interesting because, of course, you know the New Testament was written in Greek. That was the lingua franca of the ancient world. That was a precise language, Koine Greek. A very precise language in which God expressed not just general thoughts, but in which he expressed with precise words, precise theology, and with a man trained to use his mind so that he expressed precisely and exactly what God would communicate to man through the written word of God. God makes no mistakes. It wasn't written in Sanskrit. It wasn't written in Ugaritic, in cuneiform. It was written in Koine Greek, the common Greek of that period of time. Because God wanted his word to reach that entire empire. Amazing as you look at God and his sovereign control. Reformation theology speaks of the elect and then speaks of God passing over or passing by others. This section that we're looking at here in our text tonight, dealing with Paul's second missionary journey, gives a specific illustration of that principle of passing over or passing by. God, in our text tonight, personally chose who would hear the gospel and who would not hear the gospel, at least not at that time. It also reminds us that those who hear are specifically accountable. Folks, what God brings you in contact with, what God lets you hear, what God lets you see, what God lets you experience, those are things for which you are personally and specifically accountable. You may have some insights that God gives you that someone else does not. You're going to be the one who is held accountable for those insights that God gives you into his word. Very important that we take advantage and that we respond properly to the input that God makes in our lives at every moment of every day of our lives that we would be sensitive to the moving of the Holy Spirit so that we would understand what God is doing in our lives through our lives to reach others for Christ and to build us up in our faith. How do you respond to adversity? Do you know the scriptures that deal with that? Do you respond with scriptures and with the attitudes that God wants you to, to respond with in times of adversity? How about times of joy? Do you become complacent? Do you become lazy? How about times of blessing and goodness? Do you take it upon yourself to congratulate yourself instead of to thanking God for what God has done in your life rather than what you have accomplished? He's purging out the dross in us. He's making all that stuff come to the surface so that it can be skimmed away 
and so that finally the refiner will have purified us as gold and he can look in and see the molten metal of gold with no dross in it and see his own image reflected there he's developing in us the image of Christ showing the reflection of Christ in our lives that's his goal with each believer to refine them and it takes fire to refine gold well back to our text it's better in simple terms not to hear than to hear and reject and so Paul passes by at the direction of the Spirit of God those vast areas of territory and does not stop for a preaching campaign Acts also records that Paul visited other cities after he got to Troas Troas is on the coast so as Paul travels across what we know today as Turkey until he finally reaches Troas which is on the coast there he doesn't preach anywhere but after Troas he goes to a number of cities that's why we have Paul's epistle to the Philippians the Colossians the Thessalonians the Corinthians and the Ephesians which is on his return journey as he comes back across the sea uh, he has made there he has established there a church at Ephesus and not to some other churches north or south or east or west those are the churches where we have epistles written to them because there were specific problems in those churches which God in his sovereignty had put together <laughs> oh folks we, we serve an incredible God so that those epistles cover everything that is necessary for the church today no matter where it is in the world do you understand how important the missionary journeys of Paul are as he plants churches in specific cities and then writes letters to some of those cities not to all of them but writes letters to some of those cities because those letters give to us the full the complete the absolute final and finished revelation that is necessary to deal with every problem in the church every joy in the church every blessing in the church every heresy that will appear in the church every apostasy and falling away from the faith that might occur in the church that's why God told Paul to go west and go to those cities in particular and that's why we have the books of the New Testament that we have today we serve a magnificent God the sovereign God a God who controls everything a God to whom someday we will give an account for the things done in this body oh that we might be found faithful for it is required in stewards Paul writes to the Corinthians it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful what has God entrusted to you what's in your hands what do you have that someday you will give an account for not you hope you don't have to but you will give an account for what God has entrusted to you what about your abilities what about your gifts what about your time what about your money what about your talents what about your opportunities to witness what about your family the way that you have raised them in the faith or responded to those who are your parents your people how about the words that you've spoken Jesus says in Matthew 13 every idle word that men shall speak they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment every idle word not just when you stood up and made big speeches not just when the pastor stood here in the pulpit so that he could preach How about those little stupid comments you make during the day every idle word that men shall speak they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment we serve an omnipresent and omniscient God he knows your thoughts you'll give account for those as well and so 
We have Paul's epistles to the Philippians, the Colossians, the Thessalonians, the Corinthians, the Ephesians, and not to some other churches north, south, or east. We notice also that Paul visited some other cities as well as those I just mentioned. He visited Neapolis. He visited Berea. He visited Athens. He visited Sancria. We know that because they're listed in the book of Acts. We see them on the missionary journeys. But Paul didn't write letters to them. God didn't see fit to have him write letters to those churches. God covered everything we needed to know in the letters that were written to the churches that we have in the New Testament. Paul then went to Rhodes. Then he went back to Jerusalem. And then he went back to Antioch. Incredible journey that Paul makes on this second trip. In studying the way in which God gives direction by prohibition and freedom, we've got our prohibition tonight, don't go this way. We'll talk about the green light next week when God does give direction. The positive direction as to how you know when that comes. But we need to lay some basic ground rules for knowing the will of God. Number one, and we could spend our entire evening on this first one. But the first rule to remember is God never gives direction that is contrary to his word. Let me say it again. God never gives direction that is contrary to his word. He will never tell you to do something that makes you violate either a specific command, prohibition, or principle of scripture. Because God's word is the final authority. Remember that. When the devil tempts you to do something that's not quite in line with the word of God, and it seems like all the circumstances have come together to make that possible, it is not the will of God. Because God never commands you or moves you to do something that is contrary to his word. His will is revealed in his word. So if you want to know the will of God, that's the place that you're going to start. Let me give you a couple of verses. You know them. They're out of Psalm 119. It's a great passage for dealing with many of these issues that we're talking about tonight. Psalm 119.11 Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You want to walk in God's path. You want to know his will. You want to do his will. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. If you get off the path, you're in the darkness. Psalm 119 makes that very clear. In fact, many passages of scripture do. So anything that is contrary to the word is not according to the will of God. How about Psalm 119, 130? The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. You want to understand the will of God? You say, well, I'm not very bright. I can't know a whole... Well, then learn from Scripture. The entrance of thy words giveth light. If you don't find a specific command there, if you don't find a specific prohibition there, you will find a principle that covers whatever the question is that you're dealing with. Back to that one about uh, the college question that all the young people are asking, you know, who should I marry kind of a thing. And they go to the Ouija balls and all kinds of other stupid things like that. Uh, oh... I saw it all in college. I mean, at a Christian college, kids doing that stuff. You know, a little black eight ball that they turn upside down and an answer would come up or the Ouija boards and I had some experiences with some college kids where they were clearly contacting demons. I mean, horrendous bad stuff. But anyway, that's not where you find the will of God. You don't go to a seance. You don't go to a fortune teller. You don't go to a palm reader. You go to the scripture and the principles are there. And it tells you there are certain people you can marry and there are certain people you cannot marry. It makes it very, very clear. We'll not go into that tonight. But, you know, the Word of God does lay down some ground rules for it. Go to the Scripture first. God never gives direction that's contrary to His Word. Number two. God never tells a believer to do something that is morally reprehensible. God never tells a believer to do something that is morally reprehensible. If you are being led into something that is morally reprehensible and you can fill in the blank there with whatever you want, you know it is not God's will. It is sin. 
Don't think that just because God worked it out for you to be with this certain person in the dark, alone at a certain time, and they seem to be very receptive and responsive, that therefore it's okay to go ahead with whatever you think you want to do. Don't just think that because, you know, somebody dropped a, a hundred dollar bill on the floor of your office that it's therefore okay to pick it up and put it into your pocket. After all, circumstances would seem to dictate that, hey, that's a, that's a wonderful godsend and you pick it up and you stick it in your pocket and you don't tell anybody about it. I actually had that situation happen. I was out with my son Ariel and we were on visitation. We were going door to door, knocking on doors, handing out tracts, witnessing. We pulled up to a curb, we got out of the car, and as we got out, Ariel looked down and he saw a roll, not a single, a roll of greenbacks tied together with a rubber band in the gutter by the curb. <laughs> and he'd learned his lesson well. He said, you know, we can't keep this. Now, you know, most people, if they had come along and they had found a roll of bills, there was several hundred dollars in that. If they'd found a roll of bills lying in the gutter next to the curb, they said, finders keepers, losers weepers. They said, wow, what a blessing from the Lord if they were Christians of certain stripe. They said, we can't keep this. I said, you're right. He said, we need to turn this into the police. I said, you're right. Because somebody will report that they've missed it. So we went down to the police station. The officer behind the desk could not believe it. That we were bringing back a roll of bills? I mean, it wasn't a check made out to somebody else. It was a roll of bills. And so he took down our name and our telephone number, and we turned it into the police. Now, I don't know what happened with that police officer, what he did with it. But at that point, it's not my responsibility. Nobody ever called us and offered us a reward. We don't know if somebody called into the police station and claimed it. We don't know whether he stuck it in his pocket or whether he put it into the general fund for them all to go out and buy pizzas. But that's what he'll have to give account for when he stands before Christ. Dear people, God never tells a believer to do something that is morally reprehensible. Psalm 119.11 makes that clear. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. In the final analysis, all sin is against God. Yes, we sin against brothers, but all sin ultimately is against God. God. Or how about Psalm 119, 138? Thy testimonies that thou hast commanded are righteous and very faithful. Righteous and very faithful. God never tells a believer to do something that is morally reprehensible. How about Psalm 119, 140? Thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. God never tells you for this is his word to do something morally reprehensible because thy word is very pure therefore thy servant loveth it how about Psalm 118 172 the very end of Psalm 119 my tongue shall speak of thy word for all thy commandments are righteous righteous God will never tell a believer to do something that is morally reprehensible. Principle number three, knowing the will of God. God never gives direction that is a mixture of truth and error. God never gives direction that is a mixture of truth and error. Listen to what Jesus said in his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, verse 17. The, sanctify them through thy truth thy word is truth not thy word is truth with some cool ideas or thy word is truth plus I've got a few things in there that came from some of the philosophers sanctify them that is set them apart through thy truth you're different than all the rest of the world you've been set apart that's what the word sanctification means means to be set apart. You're set apart 
from the world, the flesh, the devil, from sin, and you're set apart to God. Sanctify them through thy truth. How does God do that? He pulls you through the sieve of his word. He gets all of the grunge out of you by pulling you through his word, and that word of God strips all the filth from you. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. It goes back to that initial principle. The word of God is never or conflicted by the will of God. God never tells you to do something that is in violation of any principle that's in his word. How about John 17, 19? And for their sakes I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. And of course you know what Jesus said about himself in John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. God never gives direction that is a mixture of truth and error. So if you think that God is giving you direction and you perceive in it that there is some error, there is something in violation of something that God has said in his word, and there's also some good stuff over here, God doesn't mix poison in the water. He never does. So, in all questions of faith and practice, that is, the practical Christian life. Scripture is for us, of course, the first source to which we turn. But as Paul is here on his second missionary journey, not all of the scripture had yet been written. So as we look at this, we have to learn some other principles concerning what was happening here in the book of Acts. You see, he hadn't written those letters to those churches that he hadn't yet visited on this particular journey. He hadn't gone there, planted a church, and then later wrote an epistle back to them. He's still on his way to those churches that are in Greece, like Corinth and Thessalonica. Those are churches he'll later write epistles to. Part of the New Testament has not yet been written at this time. So we see some unique features in the direction that Paul received here. And these are some unique features that will not apply to you. The first thing we need to remember is that Paul had the gift of knowledge and he had the gift of prophet, as well as, of course, all the other revelatory gifts. There were seven of them. But two of the gifts, two of those gifts are related to our text tonight. They're temporary gifts that now have been done away. We know that from that passage that I mentioned this morning, which is a always known as the, the great love chapter of the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. But that chapter is right in the midst of a discussion of spiritual gifts. Chapter 12 deals with the spiritual gifts. Chapter 14 deals with the spiritual gifts. And the last few verses of chapter 13 deal with the spiritual gifts. But we have that great extended portion there that deals with love because Paul is trying to tell them that folks there at Corinth, don't you understand? You're all excited about gifts, but love is more important than gifts. And love is the first of the ninefold fruit of the Spirit. And that is far more important that you be manifesting that than that you go around puffing yourselves up and patting yourselves on the back as to what gifts you have and how showy they are. The temporary gifts are mentioned in that passage here. Beginning down in verse 8. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Prophecy was going to get axed, but love would not. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. There was coming a time when tongues would get the axe. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. We're not talking about knowledge in general. We're talking about the gift of knowledge in this passage. This is dealing with spiritual gifts. That's the entire context around 1 Corinthians 13. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. Those gifts were partial gifts, the gift of knowledge and the gift of prophecy. The gift of knowledge was the reception of new special revelation that God gave that had not been revealed before. And that knowledge contained what the New Testament calls the mysteries. There are 17 mysteries that are listed for us in the New Testament. And Paul explains in Ephesians chapter 3, that a mystery, using that term in New Testament terms, 
a mystery is something that was not revealed in the Old Testament, but is now revealed unto the apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So Paul is saying here, there's going to come a time when those three gifts are going to get the axe. The gift of prophecy, the gift of tongues, and the gift of knowledge. It shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, and here's the place where the battle rages against the charismatics, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. <laughs> Do any of you remember how you used to think as a kid? I look back and I just laugh at it. The crazy things that I came up with as a kid. Of course, I still come up with crazy things as an adult. But, I mean, you know, I didn't think exactly the same way that I think now when I was a child. I have a whole different perspective on life now. Because there's a whole lot more experience and a whole more, lot more understanding of what the world is about. A whole lot less naivete. When I was a child, I thought like a child. I understood as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. Now I hope you picked this up as we were going through that passage there. It's not a question of if those gifts would be done away. It's a question of when would the seven sign gifts be done away. Now, we've already done an extensive study in the past on the 22 spiritual gifts. Fifteen of those remain. The seven revelatory gifts have been done away. Those were necessary for the reception and proclamation of the new special revelation. Those were the gifts of apostle and prophet, healings and miracles, tongues and interpretation of tongues, and the gift of knowledge, which was foundational for all the other gifts. That was where the new revelation came, and then it got dispersed through those other revelatory gifts. Tongues was communicating that gift or that new revelation in a foreign language that you'd never studied. Prophecy was communicating that new revelation in your own tongue. 1 Corinthians 13.10, the one that we've just read, tells us when those revelatory gifts were to be done away. And this all ties into our passage tonight because God is speaking directly to Paul and telling him exactly where he's supposed to go and exactly where he's not supposed to go. It tells us when the perfect is come. Now you look at the context there and you're talking about new special revelation. The perfect in its context is that which is complete. It's teleos. It's that which is perfect, mature, fulfilled. That which is complete. It's the complete revelation of the New Testament canon. When the New Testament was finished in its writing, then those gifts would no longer be necessary and God himself would cut them off. And we studied that in detail a number of months ago. So I'm only going to quote you just one verse. It closes out the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 22, 18. The New Testament is fulfilled, folks. There's no new revelation being given today. God speaks to us through his word. Jesus is speaking here in this verse. He's talking to John. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show his servants the things which must shortly come to pass and sent and signified it unto his servant John. It's the way the book of Revelation opens. Here's how it closes. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. book of Revelation is the final book that was written. It was written about 96 A.D. No more books were added to the canon after the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation closed the canon of the New Testament. So it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. And when the scriptures were completed, tongues, prophecy, and knowledge ceased. Everything you see today that claims to be in one of those categories is a counterfeit that comes from the world, the flesh, or the devil. And I have seen some of it up close, in person, and it is counterfeit because it is contrary to the word of God, and God never, never, never goes contrary to his word. 
and the Holy Spirit who inspired the Word of God never does something in violation to that which he has inspired. So the will of God. Can't believe our time has gone by this fast. All right, there are 23 verses in the Bible where the phrase, the will of God, occurs. Now, that's not the only place you find the will of God. You find the will of God over and over again. But it's interesting to find these 23 phrases, uh, or 23 occurrences of the phrase, the will of God. And that's where we ought to begin our study on how to know the will of God. Just going to go through a few of them. I obviously can't get through all of them tonight. But um, how about Mark 3.35? It relates to obedience. For whosoever shall do the will of God, the same as my brother and my sister and my mother. That's Jesus speaking there. The will of God includes active obedience. So what do you know the Bible has told you to do? Not just what is the Bible telling you to believe. What do you know that the Bible has told you to do? Jesus said, Whosoever shall do the will of God, the same as my brother and my sister and my mother active obedience to what you know. You may not know everything yet, but I know that you know some of the things that are the will of God. As you grow in your faith, as you study the Word of God, you will learn more of the things that deal with God's will for your life because they deal with the lives of all believers. That's where you start. What's the general things that God has told me to do? And I better get on the stick and obey what I know because I will not get further light until God has worked in my life and I begin to walk on the path of life and the path of light. You won't get further understanding until you obey what you know you're supposed to do. Second principle, service. Acts 13, 36. For David, after he had served his own generation, by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. Of course, here he's preaching about the resurrection of Christ and showing how David had prophesied the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ who would rise from the dead. But notice that little phrase, after he had served his own generation by the will of God. We're not just down here looking for pie in the sky and the sweet by and by. We are down here because we are to be serving our own generation by the will of God. So it's not merely actively obeying God, but it's all confined to one little bubble that surrounds us. It is an active service that gets out and does something in the world so that there will be a testimony for Jesus Christ. How about our plans? Romans 1 verse 10. Making request, if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. Do you include God in your plans? Oh, simple things. Say like going on a vacation. Do you work it out so that as you're on your vacation, there will be a place for you to stop and go to church? <laughs> you know, that's the will of God, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. But exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully, ooh, that's the immediate context of not forsaking ourselves together. There remains only a certain fearful looking for of judgment. What you know to be the will of God, do you include God in your plans? Making request, if by any means not length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. How about, we see the will of God is never in conflict among the members of the Trinity. Romans 8, 27. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. How thankful we are for that. You know, Christ makes intercession for us. That's Romans 8, 27. But the Holy Spirit also makes intercession for us according to the will of God. So you have the Father, you have the Holy Spirit, you have the Son. They are in perfect unity concerning God's will for each and every one of our lives. How about life transformation? Did you know life transformation is the will of God for you? In the presentation of your bodies, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, 
that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, what's the next part? That ye may prove, what is that? Good and acceptable and perfect will of God. transformation of the life that is the will of God God takes you as you are but he does not leave you as you are he transforms your life that is the will of God have you presented your body a living sacrifice it belongs to him you are not your own you are bought with a price the scripture tells us Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit. What do you do with your body that does not glorify God? What do you do in your spirit that does not glorify God? Scripture says, and whatsoever you do, whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. Are you glorifying Christ with your body? Are you glorifying Christ with your mind? And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. Colossians 3, 3 through 25. Life transformation. Internal fruit of the Spirit. Romans 15, 32. That I may come unto you with joy by the will of God and, be with, and may with you be refreshed. I wish we had time to, to focus on that, but we've already done a study on the fruit of the Spirit, the ninefold fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. But the will of God is that you should bear the fruit of the Spirit in your life. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. The will of God is that that should be manifest every moment of every day in your life and in my life. That Christ might be glorified because that is a reflection. If you look at those ninefold fruit of the Spirit, the ninefold fruit of the Spirit is a reflection of the character of Christ. Every one of those things are key to the character of Christ. And God graciously in transforming us in that passage that we just saw in Romans 12, 1 and 2, God begins to bring forth from our lives a real fruit, a living fruit that, that flows through us and out of us to others so that they see the beauty of Jesus living in us. The spiritual gifts are clearly the will of God. I mean, Paul mentions that. I've got one, two, three, four, five verses here where he talks about his spiritual gift of apostle in relation to the will of God. I'll just read them for you. 1 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, 2 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, Colossians 1.1, 1, 1, 2 Timothy 1.1. 1, 1. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, under the church of God, which is at Corinth. Ephesians 1.1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints, where should Ephesus. Colossians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. 2 Timothy 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. Do you know that you have certain spiritual gifts that God has given to you according to his own will? The Spirit divides us severally as he will. You didn't get to choose your spiritual gifts. I didn't get to choose my spiritual gifts. God chose them and gave them to us because God is building the church. Jesus Christ said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And God takes and places the gifts as he wills in local bodies, in local assemblies of churches, so that there is available the full complement of the gifts that are necessary for that church. Not the charismatic gifts, not those seven gifts that were temporary, that related to new special revelation and the authentication of the new revelation, the gift of healing and the gift of miracles, that proved that the message that the apostles were giving was true. But the other gifts are still available 
evangelist and pastor teacher and teacher, the gift of helps, the gift of giving. Ooh, yeah, that's one of the every believer gifts. There are some of them that are every believer gifts. There are some of them that are restricted gifts. There are some of them that are gifts that are given to men only, not to women, like the gift of pastor teacher. Though some people try to fake it, even though they don't have those gifts. But they're quite good in terms of the world's abilities. Yeah, the spiritual gifts. Well, we're way past time. I'll give you one more. <laughs> Service to other Christians. 2 Corinthians 8, 5. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. It is the will of God that we serve one another in love. The will of God, you want to know it? The place to start is by looking at the scriptures that talk about the will of God. And as you gain light and obey the light you've got, then God will give you more light so that as you walk through the path of life, God will make things happen in your life that place you squarely in his will and fill your heart with joy and gladness. Time's up. Gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power. There's so many exciting things for us to learn and so many things that as we open the scriptures and as we compare scripture with scripture that suddenly burst forth with beauty and color and glory and light and joy and peace. So many things that give us a glimpse of heaven a glimpse of the way someday the church, the bride of Christ, will appear in her shining raiment of white as she greets her heavenly bridegroom. Father, help us to be a people who want to be in the center of your will. Not a people who just wants what we want like a little kid, but who earnestly desires because we love you to be exactly where you want us to be, doing exactly what you want us to do, exactly at the time you want us to do it, and doing it with full heart and joy and with all of our might. That we might be committed people, dedicated people, people who serve, people who manifest and show forth the love of Christ, people who bear the fruit of the Spirit, People who exercise our gifts not in pompousness and not in pride, but in humility and by love serve one another. Father, we commit these things to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for tonight is number 147, How Great Thou Art. One hundred.